I said we were going to revisit some of the basic bits about uh, waves and oscillations in each of the subsections that came after. So here's our first revisiting. It's the process of uh, reflection. Excuse me. And if we're talking about the context of sound waves, we're really only talking about echoes. Yeah? Uh, pressure waves in air reflecting off a hard surface. Classic uh, echo. So if you go and listen to some music in the cathedral, for instance, the whole experience is based around the fact that things are echoing all over the place. Right? The sound that you hear, that you perceive, uh, is intrinsically dependent on the environment in which it's being played. Music is written specifically for performance spaces like that. If you go into a cinema, it's quite different. An acoustic engineer has a totally different brief in that environment. Uh, it's, it's why you have so much soft furnishings uh, and sound absorbing wall surfaces and carpeting and so on in a, in a decent cinema. It's because you need, or a concert hall, right? anything like that, they're all the same. Right? Going to the Marlowe Theatre, it's exactly the same. It's designed this way. Because they need the music, whatever it is, the performance, to sound exactly the same whether the theatre is completely full or half full. Right? So they need to think about um, the reflective or the absorbing properties of human bodies in the audience. Right? Now, it'll either amuse you or annoy you, I'm not sure which, but you know, the, the, the average male has, um, will absorb sound in pretty much the same way as uh, about a square meter of open window. Okay? So acoustically, that is who you are. Right? You're a certain size of open window. Um, now, that means you've got to design the furnishings inside a concert hall or a theatre or a cinema, whatever it is, that mimic the sound absorbing properties of the human body. Right? Apart from needing to control echoes and all that sort of stuff, right? Leaving that aside. Um, so actually, you know, acoustic engineers spend all their time worrying about echoes. Reflection of sound waves is a major part of their jobs. Controlling it uh, in one form or another. Um, and if you go into the sports hall, certainly, right? It's a bit like the cathedral, really, only not quite so uh, impressive as a visual piece of um, architecture. But it's it's just all reflecting walls. It's why it's so annoying when someone shuffles in their seat during the exam in the summer, right? Because it bounces around all over the place. Absolutely, everybody hears the chair move. Um, there's not a lot you can do about it, but that's the nature of the reflecting surfaces in that way. Okay, refraction. Refraction happens with sound waves as well. It's, you know, these are just waves after all. So Snell's law applies. Uh, and the thing with air is that sound, uh, the speed of sound waves varies depending on the temperature of the air. Um, so at zero degrees centigrade, it's 331, as it says on the screen, it rises as the air temperature goes up. So if we get up to 20 degrees centigrade, say this room, um, the wave speed has increased already to over 340 meters per second. Right, now that actually explains why um, it's not just anecdotally the case, it is objectively the case that sound will carry further at night. It's because you get these temperature reversion effects between night and day. Right? You all know that you get a ground frost in the winter sooner than you get things frosting and freezing higher up. Right? The two temperatures people talk about in terms of weather forecasts are that associated with ground frost and then there's another one which I guess it's metric now but it always used to be measured four feet above the ground. Right? There will be different temperatures because at night time the ground gets cooler <coughs> than the air above. Okay, and if that's the case, then given the wave speed change, 
then we know that Snell's law is going to tell us uh, that at night time, refraction is going to be vaguely in that direction as the temperature of the air changes as you go above the cold ground. Whereas in the day, the ground is what gets heated up the quickest. The surface of the ground anyway. So we have warmer air near the surface of the ground, so the refraction effect is going the other way. Wave speed is now decreasing as you go up above ground level. So in the daytime, your sound waves are tending to refract, up, refract upwards. At night time, they're tending to refract back towards the ground again. So it is genuinely the case that sound carries further at night than it does during the day. It's purely down to refraction. Um, well, we get diffraction and interference effects as well uh, with sound waves. So if you're in the right sort of environment, and it's quite tricky <coughs> again in a room like this because we suffer from echoes from all these sort of hard walls around us. Um, but you can demonstrate diffraction, certainly, with sound coming through a door that's wide open, in other words, a big gap, compared to the sound wavelengths, um, as opposed to a door that is mostly closed, so a small gap. Right, it's something you can try if you can find a suitable space to do it in. But we'll also get interference effects. All we need, remember, remember is, is a couple of waves overlapping one another. The principle of superposition kicks in, and provided we've got a constant phase relationship between those two waves, then that superposed pattern will be a steady interference pattern. Okay, so we can, do, we can produce an interference pattern from sound waves as well. So this is a sort of cartoon type image uh, of that. And I've requested the kit to, to demonstrate this to you next week. All right, we'll try and do it in here. It's not trivial because, again, we've got all these refracting surfaces, which messes it up. But it's way too cold to take this out uh, outside and do it, which is what we should try and do. Um, so we're going to have a couple of loudspeakers. They'll be emitting sound waves, surprise, surprise, at some frequency or another. Um, and where those sound waves overlap, providing we keep a constant phase relationship between the two uh, loudspeakers, we'll get an interference pattern established. All right, this is it sketched out here. So we've got a line here where we've got a lot of um, constructive interference, right? So wave peaks. Uh, overlapping, wave troughs overlapping, and so on. Right, so some high amplitude directions. There's another one out through there, <coughs> and we've got some low amplitude directions where things are out of phase. So C and G uh, on that diagram, they're illustrating those directions, and that's our interference pattern. Right, and there's no reason at all why we can't do this uh, with air. And the experiment I'm going to try and get you to do next week. Basically, right, that's you. That's your sound detector. And we'll use that to probe uh, the interference pattern in the room if, uh, if we can make it work. Um, there is a cartoon I can show you, um, which is probably, I've not checked, it's probably the same one that I used um, earlier. But let's just see. So we've got two sources here, and I don't really need to know that. Thank you. All right, so it's slow enough to see what's going on, I guess. All right, these are producing um, same the same frequency. We'll assume same amplitude. All right, two point sources. Here's our two loudspeakers, uh, and essentially you can see these directions coming out here where we're going to have high intensity and low intensity. So this is the pattern that we're referring to as an interference pattern. And it's this sort of arrangement that I'm going to try and set up for you uh, next Wednesday if it works. The sad thing is it won't record well. All right? So if you want to see this in practice, you will have to turn up. Uh, it won't record well because a fixed camera with a, well, more particularly a fixed microphone, 
is evidently not going to be able to track through the interference pattern. All right, it really will need your mobile detector system um, in order to better map it out. All right, now, there's an equation that tells us how far apart the maxima or the minima are. Um, they're equally spaced, maxima and minima. Um, I'm going to derive this for you later. When we get to interference patterns with light, with electromagnetic waves, we'll go through the derivation. For now, um, I'm just going to give you the equation because it's a relatively straightforward one. We've got to make certain assumptions, and when I go through the derivation, you'll see why those assumptions uh, and uh, limitations are necessary. But we need to um, make sure that the distance between the speakers and the detectors, in other words, your ears, is greater than the separation between the two loudspeakers. Right? So that's our first requirement of this, of this setup. Right? You can actually do the calculation if that's not true. It's just that you can't use this really very, very simple, straightforward equation down here. It's a much, much longer beast. Um, we're also going to need to uh, assume um, that, oh, and actually, no, the, well, the rest of it we don't need to worry about too much for now. But here's the wavelength of our sound waves then, lambda. So the separation between the maxima in our interference pattern, or the separation between the minima in our interference pattern, same thing, uh, is given by the wavelength multiplied by the distance between the sound sources and the detector. All right, so we're taking essentially the midpoint between the two speakers as our reference point here. Um, divided by the distance between those two speakers. Yeah? So you should be able to calculate relatively straightforwardly, if we can get this demo set up in the, in the lecture theatre here, uh, what ought to be forming this interference pattern and then you get the chance to test it out and see how good uh, that approximation is. So, you know, if you're sat where you are, for instance, in the front row and I've got the two speakers up here, we're in sort of violation of one of our approximations, right? That the distance between these two speakers has to be small compared to the distance between them and the observer. All right, so for some of you, it's going to be a better approximation than for others. So those of you sort of middle row and backwards should be getting this pretty spot on. And if you really want to test it, you just have to get out of your seats in the front row and climb up the steps, right? Do it somewhere else. Right, next thing. We can easily demonstrate this next week as well. Uh, this is the phenomenon of beats. Uh, you all have heard it uh, at one point or another, I'm sure, and if not, you definitely will when I do the, the, um, the demonstrations next week. But if we've got two sounds of slightly different frequency, and we'll talk about what we mean by slightly later on, it's a bit of an um, ill-defined thing. But we've got these two frequencies, F1 and F2. Um, all you'll hear all your ear will perceive if these frequencies are close enough is a single frequency which is the average of those two. You won't distinguish the two separately. <coughs> now, this is why it's a bit of a movable phase because different people's ears are more or less sensitive to this. Um, but, you know, ballpark figure for audible frequencies, you know, closer than about 10 hertz you won't hear the difference between the two. You'll not hear two frequencies, you'll just hear the average of the two. But the interesting thing will be that <coughs> the uh, intensity that you hear will go up and down with time. It will modulate. Right? And it goes up and down with a frequency that is the difference between F1 and F2. Right? So in other words, the closer those two frequencies are, the slower the modulation and in intensity that you're hearing. Um, I don't know, have you come across these straight line symbols before for a modulus of a number? It just means you ignore the sign. <coughs> All right? So you regard it as a positive number, come what may. So it doesn't matter whether F1 or F2 
is the bigger number. <coughs> You're simply taking the numerical value and ignoring the fact that there might actually be a negative sign there. Okay? Doesn't really matter. Uh, and what's happening, I think I've got a cartoon that I can show you of this as well. So <coughs> here's what we've got. Uh, it's a couple of ways with slightly different frequencies. It's all the principle of superposition, right? That's, that's physically, that's what's happening here. So we're just adding up displacements at every point along this axis. And you'll notice there are some parts of this where, you know, they're approximately out of phase. So we're going to get something resembling destructive interference. Uh, and lo and behold, if you add them together, you do actually get something, a region of really low amplitude. But we move along a little bit, you know, this sort of region here, these are approximately in phase. So apply the principle of superposition again and you're going to get uh, a much greater uh, amplitude. Okay, and this is just going to repeat itself. So high amplitude, low, high, low, and so on as we move along. So the intensity that we hear is given by this envelope, which is just the difference between these two frequencies of the waves that are moving through each other up here. Okay, so what we hear is the average of those two frequencies. That's basically that's the dominant frequency in this pattern. But the intensity of that sound is being modulated now um, with a frequency that is the difference between the two. Um, so, as I say, this is just superposition. And if this works, as it did last time I tried it, uh, we can perhaps see this in... Um, cartoon form. So this is quite useful in the sense, can you pick this out or do I need to turn this turn off? It might be a little bit easier. The red isn't terribly hard to see. But here's our two waves and we have to imagine them <coughs> moving through each other on the screen. Okay, they're shown separately on the screen rather, but they're moving through each other. And we're given some a useful little pointer on both of them, this white dot, right? So they're very close in frequency, but they're not identical. So there are some regions, and this is one of them, where they're pretty close. And so we actually get, when we add these two together, we actually get something that's quite high intensity. But there are other regions, like here, look, where that peak is pretty much sitting over that trough, we end up with something that is a very low amplitude uh, underneath. And this is just the principle of superposition number. It's just this red wave on top being added to this green wave underneath and giving us the yellow one. <coughs> so what we hear is the average frequency, that's, you know, basically that's this repeat unit, but the intensity of that sound, uh, as I've said, is modulated now with a frequency that's the difference between the two. 